Hello, my name is Mauricio Lasala. I'm Deputy Director at Business and Human Rights Resource Center. And I'm very pleased to have here today with me Christine Bader, one of our board members, who just written this book, The Evolution of a Corporate Idealist, When Girl Meets Oil. So uh, we are going to ask a few questions to Christine, and uh, I, we hope you enjoy reading the book when it comes out. Hi, Christine. <laughs> Hi, Mauricio. Thank you for having me. No, it's a pleasure. Um, well, the first thing that everyone wants to know is why did you write this book? Great place to start. Mm -hmm. um, when I was working for BP in Indonesia and China, I was writing emails home to friends and family about what I was doing. This was before blogs were blogs. And um, people found it really interesting, the work that I was doing, helping invest in the health and well-being of communities and workers around big BP projects. People didn't realize that companies have folks like me doing this kind of work internally. So I started to think, okay, maybe there's something to tell there. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, frankly, it was really after the Deepwater Horizon disaster, when the BP that emerged in the press and in the investigations after that disaster did not resemble the BP that I thought I'd gotten to know so well during my nine years with the company. So to try to reconcile that BP with the BP that I worked for, I talked to lots of other friends and peers that I've gotten to know over the years of people doing similar work inside big companies and realizing that this work is really challenging and difficult and complicated and even when we think we're making great progress in some places, things can still go horribly wrong. And I realized that we needed to tell, that I needed to tell our story of people doing this work because when corporate disasters happen, we can't just assume that the companies are evil and we need to look to re regulation. We actually need to look at what's going on deep inside those companies. And not just what went wrong, but what were those people doing that were trying to prevent those disasters in the first place? Why did they fail? And I wanted to call more attention to that. Definitely. And, and one of the things our users would like to know is, does the, your conclusions in this book apply for two sectors other than oil, gas, and energy? Oh, for sure. For mm -hmm. sure. So I talked to friends who work in um, apparel. I talked to friends who work in technology. And that's what I found so interesting as I started to go about these conversations that then turned into interviews for the book is that there were so many common themes of people doing this work inside companies that everybody had to um, overcome concerns from their lawyers uh, that worried that, that by engaging we're somehow creating more risk as opposed to trying to mitigate risk. That, um, people's communications departments were just so not used to talking about challenges. They only wanted good stories. Um, and just to make, to make the business case internally is such a difficult thing to do, and also not always the right thing to do. Yeah. I don't think you don't want to distill human rights down to dollars and cents. You brought to the world this concept of the corporate idealist. Um, are there corporate idealists also in smaller and medium companies? Because I think you mentioned that almost every multinational has people working in these fields inside the companies. What about smaller and medium companies? What about uh, companies in developing um, mm -hmm. markets? China, Russia, Saudi Arabia, India. Are there corporate idealists there as well? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> um, yeah, I hope so. I mean, I think even more in smaller companies, I mean, look at the wave of social entrepreneurship. There are so many people who start up companies because they're so excited to bring a product or service into the world that they think adds some value. So it's probably a different phenomenon than in big companies where, you know, in a big company, there's such a bureaucracy and people have very siloed, defined roles. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, particularly you look at the tech sector and people who are, who are starting up products and services because they really want to have a positive impact on the world. Um, so in some ways the corporate idealist is, is redundant in some enterprises, right? Because that's, that, that's what they're there to do, they're there to, to have a positive impact on the world through business. Right. And, and what can be done to support the corporate idealist more? 
from the NGO side, from government side, from external? What can we do? We all do to support corporate. Yeah, media. from externally. Yeah. Um, well, it's interesting. I talked to one of the one of the corporate idealists who I interviewed said that he he would sometimes use his external relationships strategically to help make a case inside the company. So he he said that he would um, quietly ask one of his NGO or investor friends to say, you know, this might be a good time to write a letter on this particular issue to this particular senior executive. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that's so necessary because you know companies are now so attuned to what's going on on social media what people are saying about their company what people are saying on the resource center that you know your response rates are so high for a reason right so people care about the public discourse so um, I think continuing to raise these concerns uh, whether you're an NGO but also just as an individual investor and consumer and citizen that I have tweeted and posted on Facebook to clothing brands that I wear and shop at, like what is your policy for sourcing? How do you audit your supply chain? Mm -hmm. So I think we all have a role to play, whether it's through our organizations, but also as individuals. Yeah, asking questions, great. And um, unavoidably, there is this question about, uh, that is uh, reflected in the book between voluntary and regulatory actions. and. Everybody knows that business needs to be helped and guided um, for the achievement of human rights and the common good. In that context, what do you see uh, that is the right balance between voluntary action and regulatory action? Hmm. Well, good, smart regulation is totally essential. There is no substitute for holding companies and individuals accountable, particularly where crimes are being committed. There is no substitute for strong, good regulation. But it's not the only answer, right? I mean, you and I as individuals don't go about our everyday just making every move, deciding just on what's legal and what isn't, mm -hmm. right? We act right. based on what we want to get done that day and um, what principles we uphold, whether those are professional or moral or religious or just the culture that you grow up in. And companies are the same way. Of course their behavior is shaped by what is legal, but it is also shaped by um, you know, what, what other companies in their industry are doing and what is expected of them by their investors, by their customers, um, by NGOs, and perhaps most importantly, what their employees want their company to be and what their leadership has experienced and what they believe. So I think that um, voluntary and regulatory uh, complement each other. I don't. I don't think by any means they're they're exclusive. I think we need to look at all sorts of levers and pieces of the puzzle. Mm. Uh, Is it something in the system? Because I totally mm. agree with your premise that most people in companies, as most people in the world, are not out to do harm yeah. in the world. Most people in companies want to do good in the world. Mm. Totally agree with that. And yet. We receive 20, 30 allegations of human rights abuses by companies on a weekly basis. Yeah. Is it something in the system that leads people to make decisions that lead to human rights abuses or what? Yeah, I think it's a combination of things. And so I talk about a couple of those themes in the book. I think one that emerged that was, that's really interesting is that very few people bear witness. Very few corporate decision makers actually see the impacts of their decisions on workers at the far reaches of the supply chain and on communities. So the corporate idealists that I interviewed, a lot of them talked about how important it is for them to go frequently to the field to see what's going on, but also to arrange visits for senior leadership. Mm -hmm. So I um, quote somebody in the book who arranged trips for her CFO to go visit factories in China and didn't really like what he saw. And you can bet that she has not had to argue a lot to make the case for, for what she's doing. Okay. Um, and some people talked about how when they couldn't arrange a visit, they, they brought in pictures, right? And so I think that the business case is important, um, but I think that people really act and get engaged when they see with their own eyes, oh, th 
this decision that I made, which seems like some sort of impersonal corporate policy decision, these are the impacts that it has on real people with lives and families and hopes and dreams. And so I think that's part of it, is that particularly in a big company, you get so disconnected from the impacts of decisions. I think that's one. But I think you're right. I think there is um, a lot in the system uh, that, that provides some of the wrong incentives. So I think that there are a few companies that are um, refusing to report quarterly, anymore, right? Because it creates a short-term view, which is not good for human rights. Right. Um, but those companies are the anomaly, right? They're the exception rather than a rule. So I think the short-term focus of how the financial markets have come to be, I don't think that's inevitable. I don't think it's irreversible, but that would take a long time to break down. Yeah. Thank you, Christine. Thank, Thank you. you. Very much. <laughs> Thank you for all that you do. Thanks.